Funnily enough, I was actually talking to someone about this yesterday, weirdly. So I fell in love with cheerleading. It was firstly a bit of a joke, to be honest. I'm like not that kind of person, like smiley, covered in glitter. (laughs) And my best friend, we went to the same uni and she was like, look, I really want to join the cheerleading squad. So I was like, okay, that sounds a bit lame, but I'll come with you for support. She never went back. I ended up being the president of the cheerleading team. (laughs) It took over my life. Of Sparks? It's it's called Sparks? um, Well, Sparks is a second team. The first team I was on, we don't really talk about because they were so terrible. (laughs) They were called Royals and they were so bad. Uh, We were always last. And once when I was the president, we came second to last. And that was like really good for us. We celebrated (laughs) when they called out the the last team and it wasn't us. We all cheered. We're like, oh, (laughs) Um, but then after that, I went and joined an actually really good team called Sparks. They're like national champions. They're amazing. But I could never get my back handspring. I was never a gymnast person. So I thought, you know what? two years being in Sparks, that's like four years of cheerleading now, I need to get this back handspring. So I thought I'm going to stop cheerleading because it takes up so much of your time. It's literally like four days a week, you're in the gym training. And I'm going to get a gymnastics coach. And I'm going to work three days a week on my gymnastics. And I'm going to get this back handspring. Once I've got that, I'll come back to cheerleading. Literally my third session into gymnastics, I don't know how I did it. But I like flipped off this box instead of going backwards into the humongous foam pit that was there waiting for me. I just flipped off the box onto like the wooden floor and smashed my ass so hard, and I never went back. Oh, <laughs> no. Did you did you injure yourself? Was there like an official injury? Did I injure myself, Adam? I couldn't bloody walk. Oh. I did not walk. Oh, you poor thing! And that was the end of your cheerleading career. Yeah, because I told myself I to get to come back to cheerleading, I have to have my back handspring, and I never got it. So I just got in my head about the whole thing. But I do really miss it because it was such a fantastic sport, and it really got me into fitness. To be honest, like before that, I was eating pot noodles, Burger King, drinking nothing but Red Bull. Like I was just like boozy trash foods. So cheerleading really changed my life in lots of ways. Wow. Amazing. That's, so what, that's... what was the next step after cheerleading then? That So you said that got you into the fitness and the healthy eating. So what was the next step after that? Yeah, I guess I, to get better at cheerleading, I started training, just going to the gym, weightlifting and doing all the background work so I could become, I was a lifter. So I wanted to just be super strong. And then being in the gym all the time, I think I was working a very boring job at the time. I was like, you know, just doing spreadsheets and answering calls and uh, like mind numbing stuff. So I was spending a lot of my time in the gym before and after work. And I was looking at these PTs and they just looked so rubbish on their phones, like so Mm -hmm. disinterested. And I thought I could do that job and I could do it really well because you're where you want to be. You're chatting to people all the time. And so I thought I'm going to become a personal trainer. So then I went into PTing and the classic route of every personal trainer is you just go to like a normal gym and you just do strength training even though that maybe wasn't what I was passionate about I just kind of fell into the strength training world and I was there for a couple of years can we, can we just touch on lifting for a second like I a lot of the clients I work with like female clients think that lifting is bad and think that you know, the moment they lift weights they're going to look like the Hulk like and I wish it was that easy. Like I wish I could just lift weights, <laughs> look like the Hulk. And like, even I, I, I had someone not that long ago, and I was getting them to do something. The whole class where they squeeze a brick between their legs, just some nice adductor engagement while we're doing some poses. And they said, "No, I don't want to do that because I don't want to use those muscles." And I, I, I thought, "What?" Like, so could you speak to that a little bit? Like the idea of what happens if. A female lifts weights. What do they? What do? They, what? What do they look like? What happens so in their what body? What happens when a female lifts weights <laughs> is their testosterone goes through the roof. They grow a beard. <laughs> they get massive guns and they scare loads of boys off. No, what happens when a girl lifts weights? Um, well, I mean, if you really want to get, you know, bulky, then it's all about your diet, right? And I think that's what a lot of people don't realise that exercise, the way that you look, is like. your diet Mm. so if you don't want to get bulky then you just don't carb load that's like pretty easy if if you don't want that look 
Um, but lifting weights is brilliant. You know, what you want to make sure is that you're getting like a well-rounded diet is what I kind of call it with exercise, right? So you don't just want to be doing like single plane motion stuff, which is what I ended up doing uh, because it really just makes you totally immobile because if you try to move in like multi-planes of motion, you end up just being super stiff. And that's what I found with my body. Um, so I would always say, you know, if you are doing strength training, make sure you're moving dynamically and getting multi-planes of motion in your training. Cool. And you are a, well, I was going to say new mum, you're a newish mum. How did having a little baby boy and, you know, being pregnant and giving birth, how did that impact your training routine and where you're at now as well? Yeah. Um, hmm. So when I was pregnant, I pretty much carried on as I was doing. I box a lot. I had to give up jujitsu um, and I just kept on doing pad work and strength training. And I obviously do a lot of body weight stuff, lots of like flow work. So I kept on doing that. After I gave birth, I was not in any way to get moving. I don't know how your fanny and bum hole looks like <laughs> giving birth, mm-hmm. but I was in no state to work out. <laughs> can I can I just say, please, everyone, go on Miranda's Instagram and check out her birth story because honestly, I have to say as well, I'm honestly, I'm not a fan of research. I don't really like sitting and researching anything and guests before we chat to them and stuff. But you... Or anything you buy for the house. Or anything I buy for the house. So I just sort of <laughs> Google something and buy the first thing that comes up. But with, oh my gosh, I was hooked to your Instagram the whole of last night. Me and my little baby boy were watching and we watched the whole of your birth story and I was laughing and crying the whole way through. So please go and watch it if you haven't seen it already. Everyone listening. <laughs> Sorry, continue. <Thank> <laughs> Yeah, it took me a long time to get into exercise. I just was not physically ready to do that. Um, And then the first session back was extremely humbling. My pelvic floor was in tatters, mate. Like every time I landed a punch, Mm. I would just wet myself. So, yeah, it was very, very humbling getting back into exercise. I also had this like false sense of I'll just be able, like, when I'm ready, I'll just be able to do it all. And actually, like, getting out the house, navigating that, making time, like, Mm. it takes so much mental load. It's, like, surprising um, how much work it was to make sure, like, I got out and had my time. So it took a while for me to sort of, like, find my flow with exercise. Now I feel like I'm in a solid routine with it. I... And lucky, like we live very close to a gym, so I can just cross the road and it's there. Um, But yeah, those first few months, honestly, just don't expect anything, Mm. pretty much. Just, yeah, lower your expectations is what I would say to any woman. Yeah, it's, I find it's, it's sort of, um, it's about survival mode, really. And you just got to be so kind to yourself and then kinder again and just let go of any expectations you're you're letting go of such a big part of who you thought you were and stepping into a completely new version of yourself whilst trying to keep a little person alive at the same time and yeah you know do life and your body is so different yeah your body's so so different and actually you share a really um hilarious and lovely uh, video on your Instagram about the bounce back culture um and it's got this I hate these words bounce back it's like bounce back to your old body but why is there pressure on women to to do that it's so um, like we've got enough pressure on ourselves already. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? What are your views on it? Well, I was so uh, excited when I got pregnant because a part of me thought, phew, like I can let go of this expectation that I have of myself to look this way mm. because of who I am and what I do. Straight away, the moment I say I'm pregnant, people are like, you are going to bounce back so quick. You are Mm going to look, you're going to get skinny again so quick. Don't you even worry about it. Or you don't even look pregnant. Like you're so lucky. Like, wow, you just look so thin still. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think people are aware of it. They think they are giving you like this really lovely compliment. Like, don't worry about your weight, babes. Like you're going to get back to it. No problem. But actually it's just a massive pressure that I was really excited to let go of. Mm -hmm. And it was the number one comment I got when I was pregnant was either how skinny I look still or how skinny I'm going to be when I'm not pregnant anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, 
frustrating because you just want to let go of that pressure. It's not a compliment, is it? And and also, I feel exactly the same. People were saying to me, "Oh, you look, you still look so tiny," and I was like, "I don't want to look tiny. I want to look pregnant. I'm supporting this little child inside yeah. me. I want a big, huge bump, and I want people to tell me I look big and healthy for once in my life." <laughs> What yeah, you, you, you have permission to be big and to love your body in different yeah, forms. Yeah. But I think the world is still trying to make you conform or, or stay in love with that old form that you had, that you had pressure to be in. And I, I don't know, it's very unhealthy. Mm. Like, it, it's weird me, I, I'm, I'm being very careful, like talking about anything <laughs> through this topic. Like, <laughs> but, but one thing I'd noticed is lots of people, I think, just in general life, not just for today's pregnancy, compare themselves to people on Instagram whose life it is to be fit. Like they think, like, you know, a lawyer who works from like eight in the morning to 10 o'clock at night compares themselves to a gym instructor or an in, like, or a fitness influencer that makes all their money influencing who has an incredible body, but because they're in the gym from nine to five. And I guess mm. for some people that might be, they might see you and think, or anyone, anyone, any pregnant woman who's in the fitness industry that has managed to lose weight or whatever you want to call it, think oh my god they've bounced back so quickly and they mm. feel massive pressure to do that and i think it's also important i guess for women to realize the context of who they might be looking mm -hmm. at and not just genetics but the context to which that person lives their life and the support around them and the access they have to childcare, and whether they have a partner there to take responsibility as well mm -hmm. so that you can actually do some exercise there's so many factors in that a hundred percent and also i think i spoke about this a while ago with someone but we are constantly comparing our bodies and our lifestyle to people that actually have a disordered relationship with their yeah. body and mm. food and fitness. Mm. Like I think a lot of people in the fitness industry are undiagnosed with orthorexia. We are obsessed. I absolutely was. And people were comparing themselves to m me who was suffering with orthorexia. Can, you, can you explain what that is? Sorry. I've never heard that word. Yeah. So orthorexia is um, like an unhealthy obsession with exercise. Mm. So, you know, I was training like three times a day, but people were looking at my body like, I want that. I have her body. Honey, I'm on my feet. I do 40,000 steps. I train three times a day. Like, don't compare yourself to me. But mm. I think most people in the fitness industry do stuff with orthorexia and I think it's it's very dangerous for us to compare ourselves to them because it's it's a disordered relationship to begin with so we need to just yeah everyone just needs to lower their expectations somewhere in the middle would be nice and actually yeah, trying to work out I always think what kind of life people are leading so it's not just mm. like, comparing your life your life to people whose life you actually admire not just what they look like but like when I was at my fittest and probably look the best I was at my unha most unhappy Aww. Like at one 100%. point, like when I was like 24, I had like 5% body fat. I was boxing, I was fighting, I was doing probably an hour and a half of yoga a day, two hours of boxing uh, in, in, in different sense, weightlifting and running to all the locations I was through the day. <laughs> like I looked ridiculous, but I was deeply unhappy. And if someone said, oh, I'd yeah. love to look like you, it's like, well, looking like me involves all of that is that actually what you want is that what you want your life to be like i was so single for all that period yeah. and in my head i thought yeah. like, i'm just wasted why, why are <laughs> we all obsessed with like looking looking physically it just feels so shallow i think it's really important to be in your body and to feel strong and to feel fit and we all know uh, we feel good when we're you know a certain weight and look a certain way but it shouldn't be an obsession there's just so much more to life than obsessing over exercise and what you look like on the outside what about the inner work that's surely more important. 100%. I totally agree. And Adam, yeah, I don't think people understand how much it costs to look that certain way. And you're totally right. You know, I speak about, like, having food freedom. I'm, I think I'm still yet to get there. But to be out with your friends and to enjoy a burger and chips and a, and a soft drink with your friends and not worry about it is way more important than being in a calorie deficit and meeting your macros for that day. I think look, looking good, unless looking good is part of your like income, like if you get paid to look <laughs> good in some sense, which I guess to some degree fitness instructors do, yeah. but you know, certainly like some of my friends are like fitness models, you know, that's that their income mm. is dependent on that. But I think actually if eating well, exercising well, sleeping well, a byproduct of that is probably looking fairly toned. 
and probably looking fairly slim. Yes. But it should be that. It should be a byproduct, not the end in itself. And I think as I get older, yeah. I get that even more. Like I'm starting to, you know, I've had, I've gone ups and downs where I've just been obsessed with yoga, then ultra running and all the, all this kind of stuff. And now I'm like, actually, I want to be fit so I can live a long time for my son mm. and so that I can do some cool things that make him think I'm a superhero. That, that's kind of why I want to be fit now. And I'm sure that looking more toned be a byproduct. But equally, as you get older, you realise I'm never going to look like I did when I was 25. Dad bod. Just I'm, I'm, I'm older now. Like the fat just won't go that, <laughs> that willingly anymore. Is it, we've got to learn to love that extra inch or 10. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it's dangerous as well because we definitely compare ourselves to how we looked when we were younger. And yeah, lifestyle's totally different hormones are totally different like your body is allowed to change if i look at my grandma she didn't look like that when she was 23 <laughs> mm. does it make her any less worthy exactly. absolutely not yeah but we don't let that rule apply yeah. to us i even do it myself you know i compare my body to when i was like 22 and now it's like you know i'm a mum. i'm training less i'm yeah. working less i live differently my body holds fat differently mm. and that's just part of life and it's fine however your toxic trait is that you think everyone still fancies you as you revealed uh, this morning on uh, social media <laughs> oh my god me and adam are dying at that <laughs> that's so yeah, funny I can't help it, you know even on a bad day i'm still like hmm. <laughs> you i see you um speaking of worthiness uh, one of your videos that i that i watched uh, you talk about um you're always asking the question, you know, am I am I doing enough? Am I being enough? Am I working enough? Am I enough? And it's so relatable. And I'm I'm pretty convinced that most people on earth have that same narrative playing through their head. I know I'm one of them. Where does it come from? Why does everyone feel like they're not enough? <laughs> you know, I think it probably comes, and I hate this buzzword. <laughs> but probably something to do with generational trauma. Oh, <laughs> I, I love that buzzword, go there. Just, it just like gets passed down, you know, like our grandparents experienced lots of stuff because of the war and that generation and that gets passed down, gets passed down. And I do think nowadays that like, we're, we're really working towards like unraveling it all and we're talking about it and, and unpacking it. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's probably something to do with it. A whole, mm. I, I don't know anyone that doesn't struggle with like worthiness, to be honest. And when you do meet them, you're like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes wonder, and obviously you'll relate being being a mum as well, but when you have a, a child, everything changes so much. And I think everything you do, you think, oh my God, am I am I playing into making him feel unworthy if I don't pick him up if he's crying is he going to feel like you know I don't love him and it's it's passed down in that way as well so it's such a difficult thing yeah. to unlearn and untangle and get to the root of why it even exists but I suppose that's also also maybe why we're here on earth to come back to wholeness and enoughness maybe that's going off the deep end maybe that's part of why we're here as well here we go the end of the end is coming. <laughs> Adam, Adam's going to talk to you about logistics now go on Adam <laughs> Oh, no, all I was going to do, you I was going to do, li that, was going to do a little shout out to, <laughs> for any new parents, to a book by the School of Life called The Good Enough Parent. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, The yeah, Good Enough, it's really this. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool book. Oh, but on, on, I, th I think there is something generational in that. I think it's certainly generational trauma. But we have something that the generation before don't, in that we have abundance in every sense. An abundance of, to some of a lot of people, like access to crap food, abundance of stimuli, yeah. uh, uh, lots of things we get addicted to like easy access to drink alcohol porn all these things everything is designed now to be done quick everyone wants things so actually we don't really build self-worth because we don't have to struggle to get many things like if we if we if we want i don't know like uh, i don't know if you want to be happy if you somebody just want to be happy we can just go on the internet and just watch anything that makes us happy. We've got everything on tap. And and maybe actually that's why I think exercise is really good for people. In that if you want to achieve a goal like doing a marathon uh, or achieving a look, although maybe that's not the, the ideal, or doing a boxing match, you have to work hard. And it does give you some sense of self-worth because you've had to work towards it. You've had to face some demons along the way. You've had to grow. And I think that's maybe what a lot of people don't have anymore, the chance to truly grow and find meaning in what they do. Because so much of life now is, it has no meaning. 
the watching of Netflix, the gambling, the drinking. It's all just there for you. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Boxing, yeah, though. Off. Let's talk about boxing. Because <laughs> that's an unexpected thing to do. Like, was that your first fight you had recently? That was my second. Second fight. Did you have the first fight pre-baby? Yes, that was about four years ago. And it was quite a massive fight in terms of, like, the event was very big. And I actually lost. And I think that just got in my head. And I just scared myself off from doing it again. And you I lost badly? Myself, I, you know what? I'll tell you what happened. So I was training super hard. And then I was like super anxious about it. I was waking up, like punching the air, like switching in my sleep. And I actually took anti-adrenaline tablets the day of. Ooh. What an idiot. Because I was so nervous. And obviously adrenaline is like your saving grace. Yeah. That's what's going to get you through, going to keep you sharp. Like, <laughs> And I took anti-adrenaline tablets because I was so scared. And so the first round, mine, I've had it. I thought, this is well easy. I felt so calm. Going into the second round, I was gassed. The end of that second round, I was like, oh my God, this third round, I just have to stay alive. I had nothing in my tank to get me through. And so that was a real game changer for that second fight. Whereas before I was scared of the nerves and I was scared of the adrenaline, I kept on having to rem remind myself like the adrenaline is my special stardust that's going to help me win. Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to embrace the nerves, which was a big mindset shift for me because usually I feel nerves and I think this is a sign that I shouldn't be doing it and I'm not ready. Um, so yeah, that was a good like mental battle for me to work through. And in terms of mental battles, so you obviously did a lot of physical work. Uh, work. What about the the mindset stuff? Is Does that play as big a part in your life and what does it look like? 100%. So I had a really influential coach in my life once and he really hammered home the importance of the mental side of boxing, mm. the visualization, the affirmations, truly believing that you can do this. And that was like part of my camp that I was putting myself through was cold showers every day, meditation, breath work, visualization, affirmations on the way to the gym like I was getting in my head and like embodying this win and it was an absolute game changer because usually I'd be going to the gym and I'd get in my head and think this girl's gonna beat me up and this is gonna be so embarrassing just get through it whereas this time I was saying in my head how strong I am how capable I am I'm here to learn I'm not here to be the best I can get the win, like all these, all this stuff I was repeating to myself twice a day, every day, totally shifted my mindset. So yeah, I cannot, I cannot um, say enough how, how important that is to implement into your training or, or anything that you're doing. If you want something, actually the, the mental game, if you can win that, you've won it. Totally. Belief is so powerful, like beyond belief <laughs> and I guess that yeah. all of that work really really helped you put you in good stead for well dare I say it childbirth as well but um, I'm guessing there are a lot of surprises there as well from your birth story I, but... I think boxing's probably yeah. harder than childbirth to be honest <gasps> get out <laughs> leave <laughs> Box you, you know what when I was in my fight I was thinking if I can get through my childbirth I can get through this yeah and don't you have that in your head every time you face you face something difficult you're like this is nothing <laughs> yeah oh my god the I, we won't go too much into the the pain of childbirth but going back to your beautiful vulnerable story as well that you shared there was one part that I picked out that I could actually really relate to as well because I don't know what your your feelings are around having a birth plan or even birth preferences you know some people say oh it's you know it's important because obviously you want to empower yourself with information when it comes to it and you're at your most vulnerable but at the same time you know, 99% of women that I speak to say that their birth preferences, birth plan did not go the way that they wanted it, expected it at all, including me. Um, and you talked a lot about letting go. And you said that at one point um, in letting go of control, you actually felt like you regained some control. I don't know if you remember saying that, um, but that was a really beautiful part of the story. And I was wondering if you could just sort of elaborate on that a little bit. 
Yeah. You know what? I would still, second time round, even though my birth plan went to pot, I would still do the same. I would yeah. still go for what I want because in my head, again, it's that belief that I can do it and it was keeping me calm in the lead up. So I didn't even pack a hospital bag because I was just so sure, like, I am having this baby in the water at home, no doubt. So, yeah, it really gave me that sense of control. I have spoken about this a lot on my Instagram, but I have survived rape. And so the the idea of possibly going into hospital and dealing with a doctor, like reaching inside my body, like all these like interventions, I just thought I cannot risk that happening and then obviously it, that's what it came to and yeah I just remember having to let go and just trust this random man had my best interests at heart mm. and that was so difficult um but it helped me like just mentally get through that whole experience so yeah it's difficult to describe but I just remember in that moment just relinquishing any control and just giving it over to someone else. Wow. That's super- yeah, I forever changed. <laughs> That's super powerful. Thank you so much for being open and sharing that. Um, do you feel that maybe in some way it was almost healing for you that that experienced happened would you describe it like that is in the doctor you know having to go to the hospital and and relinquish the control and let the doctor take over was there any part of you that felt healed from that experience in some ways yes I still actually get flashbacks to that moment so like I know that there's still a lot of trauma from that time but I do think I found a sense of strength in myself that I wouldn't necessarily have had had I had my perfect dream birth. Yeah. So I wouldn't have had to dig to that level inside myself if I wasn't put in that scenario of like absolute survival. Like it was just mental. So yeah, I found a definite sense of strength that was I think taken away from me when I was younger. And yeah, I'm just, yeah, forever changed, honestly. Like my view of myself has just, I'm, su- I'm superwoman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, giving- That's how I feel about myself. Yeah, you are. And every woman that goes through giving birth is superwoman. And you, you said in your birth story, you, you felt so, you'd never felt so powerful after giving birth. And it's so true. It's just a once, well, maybe twice, maybe more uh, and of a lifetime experience. And it's um, it yeah. does change you forever. And it gives you, I mean, Adam always talks about, um, not always, but you talk about the ultra marathons you've run. And I think I could never do that, you know, run that far. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I think of what I did, you know, uh, going through childbirth and the pain of it and what I, you know, created and birthed at the end. And you think, well, well I, I can, mm. I can do anything. And you, you do, yeah. I think birth is almost like, um, it's such a, a magical experience because it really puts you in touch with parts of yourself that you didn't know exist and yeah really helps you touch the um the, the strongest parts of you as well and then you come out this this new person and it takes a long time to kind of um process all of that as well um yeah. and there's, there's there's this whole sort of nine months in nine months out um talk you know how being pregnant for nine months and then after nine months you're kind of back to yourself so how do you feel about that do you do you feel like you are still kind of processing everything or do you feel like like you've um come full circle or yeah it definitely took me longer than nine months to come back to myself i <laughs> <laughs> i'm every stage of him so far I feel like I change again so I think only now have I stopped resisting the change this I spent the first year just trying to get back to who I was before Mm. and that person is gone yeah Mm. she's she's different now 
so it's took me a long it's taken me a long time to to come to terms with who I am now um so yeah I would say now I'm in the flow of it and mm. I've accepted and I've surrendered to motherhood and changing you know I'm not I'm not a I'm not the girl that I was I'm a woman now yeah. I'm a mom so it's yeah it's very different and yeah it, it took me a long time again I was in this false thought of like three months I'll be back to where I was doing what I was doing and three months came around and I was like I gave birth like yesterday what like I'm <laughs> yeah, not ready <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally yeah yeah in terms of kind of changing the person and how challenge makes you change, like I'm a spectator in all of this, obviously. And Holly mentioned that I mentioned the marath- the ultra marathons and stuff. And I, you know, I firmly believe that they were the most formative experiences of my life. In the, you know, in these twelve hours, you go through this kind of microcosm of life, ups and downs. But comparing that to like what I saw Holly go through in labour, like it's a whole other magnitude. But, but so bearing that in myself, but, you know, on the ultra marathon run, a little bit of pain. You know, Holly was twelve hours of screaming like torture, clinging like to that, you. that level of pain, dangling off your neck. And you're like, so if that little <laughs> ultra marathon thing kind of affected me for twelve hours, God knows what that must have done. But it, I think that's important to acknowledge that when you go through suffering, you change, and when you go through labour, it is a, although there are hormones taken over, etc. It is a profound sustained yeah. amount of suffering and you can't expect that not to fundamentally change you in some way yeah ultimately you're you're being born again as well I don't know if you agree with that Miranda but I feel like yeah oh I think we might have lost have we lost your audio oh no she's no there, just she's just nodding yeah. just appreciate just, what you said I just feel like I, I want to <laughs> I just feel like I want to also share I've, I wrote um read a beautiful post from my friend Josie who also um gave birth probably around the same time as you actually um and she said yeah coming back to what you were saying about how you sort of try to cling to this old version of you because it's scary to let go of who you were and your identity because that's all you know um yeah. and there's so much letting go required and she said actually after I stopped you know trying to come back to who I was I realized that motherhood and becoming a mother is actually about reclaiming who you always were um rather mm. than sort of um you know going back to who you were before it's it's like a, a finding this new version of yourself but it's also who you always were at the core um I don't know if that makes sense I mean, I'm not doing it justice but she wrote a beautiful post about it and um it's almost like a coming home but you had to let go of that clinging first yeah I don't know about you I was very scared to go to become a mom like before I gave myself permission to become a mom I was like absolutely not I can't do that you need to be selfless you need to give so much of yourself I'm not good enough it's too scary like I just I didn't want children and it was like a big personality trait of mine like I'm not having kids (laughs) and I realized that it was coming from a place of like denying myself not thinking I'm good enough And that was a big, like, revelation for me, realising that that I can do this and I deserve to do this. I deserve to go on that journey for myself. That was um, a nice realisation. That's so lovely. So we're going a a little bit of a a different direction. Um, You said that you weren't feeling super inspired by life and you were saying that the reason is you think because you're maybe resisting this sort of different direction that you're being pulled towards and but you didn't share what it was and I was really intrigued so I'm just wondering if if you're happy to share (laughs) um, or maybe it's still sort of processing but are you being pulled in a completely different direction or what's kind of yeah your vision now your feeling now? So for the last however many years, I've been doing one-to-ones with clients and I love it, but I definitely feel a bit stagnated. Often in the fitness industry, like the next step is to open the space. You know, you've got your own gym yeah. and you've made it. Um, or you have an app and you've made it. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. Um, I thought I did. I was going to open a space a few years ago and then I just, then COVID obviously, thank God, hit and I didn't but um yeah then I kind of felt like I don't know where to go now I can't do just one-to-ones forever because boxing Mm. pad work it's like a lot on your body um so I'm I was trying to just think 
where do I belong? I've only ever really known fitness. I used to run female only classes. And so I know now that I want to move towards working in like a women's led area. I want to work specifically with women and I want to provide women like a loving space where they feel like they can just be like open and themselves and unsubconscious mm. they can bring their kids and they can just relax so I'm kind of like putting together an idea of a space where I can do that mm. um it's not going to be a big money maker but it will be a big passion maker for me and that's kind of where I want where I see myself I think there's like an obsession with nowadays of like making it big and making loads of money yeah Really, I just want to be able to have a space, make it take over, have a nice living, be comfortable mm. um, and just be like free, if that makes sense, rather than have this big, expensive, stressful thing hanging over my head. Mm. Um, so I would love to be working with like, women in the community, running workshops and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I want to <laughs> slither on over to, but it will take time. So. Yeah. The, the guy called Naval Ravikat. That's you know, he his idea is that you know, money is only useful to the extent in which it gives you freedom. Mm. And mm. I really, I really love that idea. And I think, yeah, we get so caught about making money, making money, making money, and we give all our time to it. And then suddenly, uh-huh. like our children have grown up, and all the things that we really wanted to do anyway, like go for nice walks with the family, mm. we could have done the whole time mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of waiting twenty years until we're millionaires to do that. Yeah, it's that thing of um, the stuff you own ends up owning you. Mm. Yeah. Like you just got to work to like keep this massive house going, this expensive car. And I don't want to do that. I just want to be free and enjoy my life and enjoy what I do. Yeah. You know, I, I had, when I was starting out my PT journey, I was at the point where I was earning a load of money. I was working loads. I had loads of money to spend. My hair was falling out. I looked terrible. I was just knackered. I wasn't enjoying my life. Mm-hmm. I've been there. I need to get there again. And I'm lucky that I figured that out quite early on in my life. I was like 21, 22 when that happened. But yeah, I'm not interested in getting to that point again mm-hmm. where you're just like working, working, working. Mm-hmm. My life right now is always going towards a good balance of enjoying my life and remembering what it's about and it's about spending time with people that I love and doing things that I love yeah so true I I think you always I think most people need to go through that phase though so they realize what it's like what it is like to work insanely because if it's you know if like a 21 year old comes out of uni or whatever and thinks I just want a life that I completely enjoy and that's it Mm. they'll never get the skills and the life experience they need to actually be able to succeed and get enough money to give them that little bit of freedom it's not to say they need to be millionaires but i think you need you need at some point to get that life experience of just working hard mm. seeing what it does for you but getting all the skills and attributes associated with working hard so i'm sure like you hustling for your clients at the beginning and all the all, all the chat you needed to, to get that has really helped you now build your profile on social media which will then in turn help you build a future business so that these kind of need a little bit at the beginning but i think when we're older we can free ourselves from that yeah 100 percent. when it matters so body weight oh sorry holly i was just gonna say on on that note i do feel like there's this very slow wave away from the burnout culture and the hustle and the grind and self-care is i know it's another one of those buzzwords but it is important and i think people are realizing like glamorizing less the i'm working so hard i'm so busy i don't know why that's ever been like a oh you're so amazing well done you and um we are kind of well, and maybe it's just because I'm I'm in this world, but I feel that people are leaning and interested in the self-care aspect of life now because we now realise that it's so important to recharge our batteries in order to be the best versions of ourselves for us, for the world, for our children. But but saying that is what I do. You know, I, I help people to have that time and space to have self-care for themselves. And yet I still 
struggle to gift it to myself as a mum. You know, I, I keep finding that I'm putting mm-hmm. everything else first, including things like doing the dishwasher and stuff that I know is just not that important important in the grand scheme of things like I could just sit and breathe consciously for five minutes instead of doing that and be a better person for it so I'm just interested in and in how you um do you fit any self-care for yourself into your schedule and what what does it look like I guess this is a selfish question because I want some tips <laughs> so I was actually laughing about this um because I was listening to one of your podcasts and someone was saying you know their self-care routine they were like um, they do meditation, they do the skin, and then they journal, and then they <laughs> sit still for like two hours. And I was thinking, yeah, that person doesn't have a baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I compare my self care routine. I don't know if it was a routine. I just stuff that was just part of my life that was good for me mm. when I didn't have a child um, compared to now. And you know, I was in the five a.m. club. I was up five a.m. watching the sunrise, drinking my coffee, sat outside. <laughs> You know, silence, listen to the birds chirping. I was one of those annoying people. <laughs> and I was actually just laughing about it. So now my self-care is very base level. It's not even self-care. I wash. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I take a shower. What's my hair? <laughs> I have a skincare routine because I'm nearly 30 now. So we need to start taking that seriously. So, yeah, it's nice to just, like, have a moment do my skin and just like give myself like that little bit of loving which before I would kind of roll my eyes at someone like doing skincare and calling it self-care because like I just think self-care is deeper than that it's about doing like the inner work Mm. but sometimes that's all you've got time for Mm. is the base level stuff um so yeah right now it's very base level I have started reintroducing meditation back into my life like in the lead up to my fight it was easy because I had an end goal like this is why I'm doing it but since my fight I haven't been very good at doing it so this new year I've started meditating again Mm. and I feel really really Mm. um and it's also just like using my time wisely I think is an act of self-care so like Mm. when Woody goes down for a nap I could sit there and scroll like I have for the last year and a half or I could do something that'll make me feel good like read a book um so yeah that's the kind of stuff I'm doing nowadays Mm, really good tips and just also for any new mums um that have previously meditated and haven't been able to find time something that I'm now doing is challenging myself because Sonny still sort of naps on on me I'm yet to conquer the naps and he just seems to sleep best on Mm. me um but you know you feel like you want to be doing something while they're sleeping and so just like what you said I think rather than scrolling I'll I'll just close my eyes and meditate with him on me um so there's no excuses really love so if you want to meditate you can close your eyes with your baby on you set the timer for 10 minutes and off you go and it's actually so nurturing just feeling him like breathing on me and just having that moment so you're so right though keep it like Mm. base level and just make it intentional as well I think is key dad should not do that though dads would 100% fall asleep oh you'd asleep. fall asleep yeah, don't, yeah you're not dads allowed. Don't, <laughs> don't meditate with a baby on you because you will kill the baby <laughs> that's da- yeah, danger oh god that's gone quickly for- let's just quick before we kind of start to wind down let's talk about actually some logistical stuff mm-hmm. uh so I, I guess so number one i'm wondering where the idea of body weight bitch come came from and your twitter's different your twitter's not body weight bitch it's something like my man, twitter. M- not twitter tiktok it's just oh. me getting old <laughs> tiktok which is like it's miranda fuck you or something like that it's not quite the same thing but it's what is it miranda effing fox yeah effing i knew that, i knew there's a fuck in there somewhere yeah <laughs> so what when did you start doing that because i noticed you, there's no obvious website for you it's good i guess a lot of your putting yourself out there is through that but you're doing it really well and that's kind of how you caught my attention like i saw one of your videos and i found it hilarious and i showed holly and like I was drawn in, like it's a really nice combination of humor, education, empowerment, fitness stuff, lifestyle stuff as well. Do you have an end goal with that? Or did you do it just out of like boredom and it was like something nice to do? Yeah, what's what's the plan? Yeah, well, the body weight bitch, I was just mostly training. I, well, I was only training body weight at the time. I was doing loads of primal flow, animal movements. Um, so that's why I changed my Instagram to the body weight bitch because I was just posting flow work. And then COVID hit and all I could see was like workouts and it was really boring. So then I just started posting like chatty videos instead because that's what I wanted to see. And then it just kind of like hit off for, for some reason. I don't know 
white people just, I guess, were bored as well of workouts, so they liked the content. So I, I didn't mean to turn into that. It just kind of happened. And I was thinking the other day, like, I should probably change my name from the bodyweight bitch to something else because I'm not really posting, like, I'm not a fitness page anymore necessarily, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, and now I'm obviously, like, a mum. So now my Instagram is even more all over the place. Again, I don't know I don't know if, if you post mum content, but I thought I'm not an instant mum. Yeah. I'm not a fitness page. Who, Who am, am I? I? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> That's the question. But do you know what? Just to cut in, I think, do you know what? I don't think people mind. And I was thinking this the yeah. other day because, you know, I've just got some new branding and it's all pretty colours and stuff. And, and I think, you know, if I went to someone else's perfectly branded Instagram page, I'd probably yeah. get a bit bored. And I think that people are craving just authenticity more than ever right now. And sometimes that's going to look yeah. like just a complete mess. But, you know, the, the point <laughs> is, the point, I'm not saying that you look like a mess, but the point is you're so... Yeah, yeah I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so you, you know, you're so unapologetically you. And that is what drew me in and, and meant that I was just on your Instagram for a good hour yesterday and, and loving every second as well, you know? So I think whatever you're doing, just, it, just keep doing it. And um, yeah, it's working for me. I don't know what my point was there. But I think I it that depends helpful. why people connect with you. Like if people are connecting with you because they want to do your training program, yeah. like as a course and pay you a thousand pounds, then you do need, you do want branding to be slightly formal. Yeah. But I think increasingly you can have an account that actually is more about you as a person mm. and you don't necessarily need to be the expert of all these topics, but you're passionate about mm. it and people resonate with you. And that's the important yeah, thing. So For anyone to be successful in any industry that you're like, public facing, you need some, the knowledge, but also the ability to, ability to communicate that in an effective way that reaches people and touches people and affects lives. And I guess that's kind of what you have. You, know, you 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 want to be the el- most elite boxing trainer in the world. We don't need to be, but you're you're probably making more people start boxing because that would never have done than Floyd Mayweather has this year. In fact, he's probably putting people off, isn't it, at the moment? <laughs> but you get you get the idea that actually, and you can actually build a business, not a business, but you can actually build a persona, not a persona, not even a persona. You can build something around you, and mm. you can make money from just being you. Being and that you, is yeah. that's a beautiful thing about the world now is you can do that. If you have an engaging character that people resonate with, for whatever reason that is, it's not tangible. You can make a living from being you in a in a weird way. <laughs> and that that is a yeah. question, actually. Have you, because you come across so you, I don't know how else to s- describe it. Have you always found that? <laughs> has that always come easy, or have you sort of tried being someone else for a time and thought that doesn't work? Let's just go back to being me. I think it took me a while to like find my voice on Instagram find my true voice because mm. I do think when um, we all do it like start posting and and we put on a like a different voice and we start talking how we don't speak mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot easier to be you I think when there's a camera and you're like actually like because um, because yeah you're, you're staring at yourself and you're thinking why am I saying that? I don't talk like that. And so you call yourself out. Mm. Whereas like writing captions, I'm not I'm not a good caption writer. Mm-hmm. And there's some people they like write these captions, you're like, whoa, like yeah. that's gorgeous. No, I'm yeah, not yeah. like that. So, <laughs> I was gonna point to you. <laughs> yeah. In my if you scroll back, I don't know if you scroll back to my early posts, that's like five thousand posts, but like my captions were always just like rainbow emojis and like pig emojis. Like <laughs> <laughs> Rainbow pigs. You know, yeah. Aesthetic. Yeah. Should we do some... Let's I do some quick fires forever, now. Yeah. Little quick fires. Best baby gadget. <laughs> Ooh. My boobs don't count. No. Uh. <laughs> right. Um, you know what? The Nanit is amazing. The Nanit baby cam. Do you have it? Ooh, we've, no. got, we've got a Kubo. Nanit was on the shortlist. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. Nanit's it? very good. What to get. You get thrown so many it's, options. It's very expensive. We got gifted by our friends, thank the Lord. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a very good camera. And at the first year, you get a subscription to like all the stats, so you can see them like when they wake, their yeah. heart rate, like all of this stuff. So it's very good. Mm. Uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, creating a vision board, even though you found it a bit cringe. But I'd love you to share um, maybe something that is on your vision board for this year, if you don't mind. Yes. So, I'll, well. First, it's a bit embarrassing to be honest, but I need to learn to drive. I'm nearly Yay. 30 and I don't 
drive. I'm one of those people that moved to London when I was 18 and just the tube is the best and I cycle everywhere, but it's getting out of hand now. I need to learn to drive. So that's on my vision board. Yeah. Same. Did your partner drive? Yes, and it's so embarrassing because I have to ask him for a lift to Lidl. How <laughs> lame is that? I should be able to drive myself to the supermarket. You know, no. I'm I'm older than you, and I I couldn't drive until like a few months ago. As in, I I passed my test at eighteen, and it's the same situation as you. I just never needed to drive. So until I was how old am I now? Thirty. You're coming up to thirty-five okay, this so, year. Uh, at thirty, I always forget my age. At thirty-four. <laughs> With the first time, I actually was alone in a car. The first time wow. ever, I was alone in a car. And, but since then, I'm loving it. Like, it's I just, really nice. Can I just say, I thought that it's totally irrelevant. I thought Adam was about 35 when I first met him six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's so rude. <laughs> you didn't get your skincare routine sorted, did you? <laughs> just heavy eyes. Uh, what uh, favourite boxer that inspired you? Like, if you're like shadow boxing, who are you mimicking? So my favourite box is probably Clarissa Shields. She's absolutely fantastic. She's broken down so many barriers for so many women. She's brilliant. Um, any other my faves? Um, mm, no, no, Clarissa Shields. She's she's a banger. And just to finish, this might put you on the spot a little bit, and don't worry if you want to pass it. But um, any particular quotes that really inspire you? Just to pass. Leave... No, ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Any quotes? Let me have a think. I should have prepared one. Or sort of like so many. even like concepts that just inspire. Even, you. even lyrics like Rocky soundtrack. <laughs> da da. My you body can sing says it die. My spirit cries okay. never. Just let her think. Moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. You can cut this thinking out. Okay. This. We'll just pretend that I was able to just pull this out my ass straight away. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. All good. Um. That's perfect. We can leave it there. Leave that. Just fuck. Because that's what, that's what January is all about, right? No, you need something inspiring. You need something inspiring. Oh, you know what? Okay, this isn't this isn't um, a very inspiring quote, but I do like it and it does make you think. Rejection is redirection. Love that. Oh. Simple. I like that Rejection one. is redirection. Yeah, that's really I think good. I I really struggle with failure, like the fear of failing. And if I put something out into the world and it someone rejects it straight away, I'm like, oh my God, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and that's not necessarily true. So yeah. yeah, I'm trying to like switch my relationship with failure and rejection and really trying to just, um, yeah allow myself to be right re redirected yeah. by the universe yeah mm -hmm. i'm so on board with all of that and Thank tell you so us where much. people can find you both kind of like in not, not your home address you know, like in person like <laughs> are you training places uh, <laughs> instagram etc yeah so instagram is at the bodyweight bitch and tiktok mum content lots of giggles over there is miranda f in fox and that's where you can find me. Yeah. I've got a very exciting thing coming out soon, actually, which I want to just push, if that's okay. Push, push, it's a push. free, It's a free um, workout series. So it's all body weight. It's boxing inspired. And we are filming it next week. So it's going to be available in the next couple months. And it's going to be on my Instagram, totally free and totally awesome. So if you want to shake up your gym routine, your workout routine, and you don't have any money... <laughs> oh, I'm quite tempted. I might see if Sonny wants to join me. I'd love to see you boxing. Yes. Oi, I feel like there's a sarcasm. No, I just can't imagine segment. it. I can't imagine it. I'd love to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it there before it turns into an argument. Thank you so much, Miranda. <laughs> Thank you for having me.